Hi, this is Clive Gregson, and I'm with John Broughton on Retrospectives on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Hope you're having a great day. Bye. Not the way, I don't know how much you can believe what you read on Wikipedia, but there's a story on there that your first guitar came from uh, proceeds from the sale of your brother's drum kit when you were a young, young lad. Is that, is that a true story? That is true, yes. Yeah, yeah. my brother was, uh, I have a brother who's seven years older than me, and uh, he wanted to be a drummer, so my parents, he badgered my parents into getting him a drum kit, and they did so one Christmas, and the next Christmas it was still sitting in the corner of the room unplayed so <laughs> by that point I was badgering them for a guitar and uh, so they sold the drum kit and bought me a guitar right so I'll and take actually, it in, sorry in retrospect in some ways I wish I wish they'd kept the drum kit and I'd have, I'd have probably <laughs> learned to play that <laughs> so it sounds like your brother wasn't too upset about losing his drum kit no I don't think so I think uh, you know he was he was into girls by then. <laughs> um, just talk about the formation of Any Trouble uh, before we go into more more recent things. What were your initial hopes for that band? Did you have were you an ambitious young lad with designs on on rock and roll stardom in those days? Uh, no, no, not really. I have to say, um, I was. It was all about the music for us, really. Uh, once once I got my guitar at thirteen and. I, um, you know, learned to play and got quite proficient and started writing songs. And that, you know, I was, that's all I ever wanted to do. Everything else was out of the window at that point. I wasn't interested in sport or school or anything at all, really. Um, and I suppose when I, later on, when I became interested in girls, uh, the guitar seemed quite a useful conduit, really, to <laughs> meeting girls. Um, so it was all pretty shallow, but I was committed to learning to play and write and sing. And I thought, you know, I thought I took it seriously, but no, I wasn't. I, I think I, I learned fairly quickly um, that, you know, success in the music business, you know, like success in terms of selling records and concerts and, you know, making shed loads of money <laughs> fairly often didn't really depend on having any ability or talent. You know, I often say you don't have to be good to succeed in the music business. You have to be popular. And they're, uh, they're two different things, two very different things. And I think I was a geeky kid, you know, I was a tall, skinny, wore glasses, scruffy, didn't look like a pop star at all, you know, I had no, and so I wasn't daft. I knew that I was never going to make it on my ravishing good looks so um, it was down to um, it was down to just playing and, and I think you know you learn fairly quickly that um, there's a lot more to being successful than just playing music actually playing music is a relatively small part of the whole thing but that's all I was interested in so I wouldn't say I wasn't unambitious I would, I would have quite liked to have, you know you know, I've had a 40-year career out of playing music and, and been, in strict pop music terms, been about as unsuccess unsuccessful as it's possible to be. But I've always worked. And I've also, I've never had to play music I didn't like just to play, just to make a living. I've been really, really lucky. So, Well, that, that's success yeah. in itself, really, isn't it? Uh, I guess so. In yeah. A way. Yeah. Now you're with uh, Stiff Records with that band but in hindsight was that the best label for the band to be with? Did you suffer somewhat perhaps by being compared to some of the other uh, artists that were on Stiff? Uh, I don't think that was the problem. I, some people saw that as being the problem. We were labelled with being a bit of a poor man's Elvis Costello which may or may not have been true. I, I, you know, that's not for me to say. Um, and Stiff I have to say, we we signed to Stiff because we loved the label, we liked the acts, we liked the people. We thought that what they were doing was, you know, was a great thing. That kind of big flag of independence. Um, so we made a choice, and we had, I think, we had six or seven offers from record labels around that first album. So we had a choice, and we chose Stiff because they were our kind of people, and we thought that you know they might be the best ones to let give the music a chance, really. Um, and it, I have to say they worked 
unbelievably hard for us. They were very committed to trying to make it work against overwhelming odds, really. Uh, I think the one big, well, I don't want to say negative, but the one downside of Stiff was that they were pretty European centric and mm. they signed, I think they signed any trouble because they thought we were a band that could break the label in the States, you know, much in the way that I think they saw us more like Dire Straits, for example, than anything else, a guitar kind of pop slash R&B quality band. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with that was that um, Stiff had no outlet in the States at that point. In 1980, when we signed, they'd lost their distribution deal with CBS because all they'd ever given them was you know, Ian Dury was never going to be successful. Or the, 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 they were so English Anglo-centric in a way, the bands that they'd put out through uh, CBS in the States. Uh, they'd lost Elvis Costello early on, who signed direct to CBS. So, you know, it was obvious that that could work, but it wasn't, it wasn't going to work for Stiff. And once they got us, I think they thought, this is a band that will break us in the States. But it was impossible. They just had no infrastructure. There, was, there wasn't enough money in the world to break Stiff Records in America. It was never going to happen with us or without us. And I had, in retrospect, I think had they been smarter about it, they would have basically licensed us on to mm. CBS or Warner Brothers or somebody in the States, big corporate, who could actually do the job. And that might have been a different story, but um, they kind of were resolutely independent, set up Stiff America, which lasted about three years and, you know, took us down with it, really. <laughs> so <laughs> so when, the, when the band finished up, did you have a, a clear notion what you wanted to do next? Um, not really. Uh, the band broke up really I would say we broke up in a blaze of apathy at the end of 1984 uh, there was nowhere else for us to go really we'd, we'd been with two you know two labels we'd put out five albums nobody was buying it and you know we were culty popular but that didn't pay the bills we had no gigs we had no management we had at that point we had nothing apart from a name and our guitars really um, mm. I stopped drinking um, I was also well on the way to becoming an alcoholic at that point and as were the rest of the band and uh, it, it seemed to me you know I was having health problems and it just seemed to me the sensible thing was to stop drinking and the only way I could realistically achieve that was to not be in, a band, not be in that band anymore because it, it was a very solid drinkers band and so that was possibly one of the you know the larger unpublished reasons why we stopped because we were friends and we got on and we still enjoyed playing together but it wasn't going anywhere other than me on a downward spiral of, of drink really so i stopped drinking and pretty much you know called it called it quits called it a day on the band and um without any real plan what was next to be honest I just thought I'd either, you know, I'd carry on writing or I'd do some producing or I, I didn't really have any idea what was next. <laughs> As you say, you're, you're still friends with, with the other band members there and there have been reunions through the years. Does it surprise you that the interest was still there in the band considering you didn't enjoy a, a huge major profile back in the day? Uh, well, what we found out uh, was that the only interest in the band was from us, really. <laughs> we, did, we got... <laughs> We got together, we did two more records, neither of which, you know, did a Dickie Bird, and both of which I liked very much, and they both failed abysmally. And we toured maybe two or three times to, you know, the usual apathy. So, um, you know, so no, what, the, the only real enthusiasm for the band was from... Internally. The band, nobody, yeah. yeah, nobody else. And also, when we got together and started rehearsing for the first reunion, I kind of remembered why we'd broken up in the first place. So one of the reasons, <laughs> which was, it, it just you know, I'm not built. You know, we're not. None of us are really built to be in a band long term. So it didn't. Uh, you know, it was fun for the five minutes we did it for yeah. the reunion. Now you, you, we can't do it again because Martin, the drummer, had a heart attack and can't play anymore. So oh dear, and I would, I wouldn't do it without him. So. 
that was that was that really. Now you moved on into Richard Thompson's band, a bit of a switch in direction direction musically for you. Do you think you would have ended up in later years covering the same type of musical territory that you've been covering had it not been for your time with Richard? Uh, that's a good question. Possibly. Uh, I don't know, really. The thing with I'd always been a fan of Richard. I first saw Richard play in, I think it was 1976, 75, 76 at a folk festival and was just instantly a big convert. He was, you know, I thought he was terrific. He was just a great guitar player, great writer, you know, had the whole thing for me. So I was always a fan and I kind of got to know him a little bit. And... So that came along quite fortuitously. There were two things that happened fairly fortuitously when Any Trouble wrapped up was that I met uh, Christine Collister, who was a singer from the Isle of Man working in Manchester. And I thought, you know, she was terrific. And I just thought maybe I could have a bit of a backroom role here and write some songs for her or produce her or something, manage her, whatever, just do something to help her along because she had the whole thing she was great looking she could sing she was easy you know she was just really good really really great and um, bizarrely as a consequence of you know I knew Chris we'd done some things together and then out of the blue I got a call from Richard Uh, this would be early 85 I guess something like that just lined up really um to say that uh, his he was going on tour, his usual band wasn't available. Was I interested in going on the road with him? So I said, yeah, sure, that'd be great. So I talked, I got Chris into the band as well. I thought that might work. Um, and I had ten really happy years working with Richard. It was, uh, you know, it was a real eye opener in many ways. I always used to say to people, if you if you don't want to look like a guitar player stand next to Richard Thompson you don't want to look you don't want to look like a singer stand next to Christine Collister I did both throughout 10 years so it kind of teaches you you know it teaches you a bit about yourself really yeah I guess for you, it would have been a nice change after the, the frustrations of not having that sustainable success with, with any trouble to um, to just step back and be part of someone else's band for a while. It would have taken a lot of pressure yeah, off you. Yeah, it was. And it was music that I, I loved anyway. Um, and it was challenging. You know, Richard's not, you know, it's not the three chord trick. He writes some fairly complicated stuff. So it was, uh, you know, it was just good discipline. It was a good learning curve. And but it was music I loved anyway, so it was quite nice to not have any any responsibility other than to show up for the gig and sing and play as, as best I could, really. Looking at those years with, with Christine, you amassed quite a following, the, the two of you. Uh, I know we love seeing you down here in Australia. The, the, the memories must be very fond of those years. Uh, yes. Um, it was... <laughs> I was thinking about it. We only came to Australia once to play, actually which I've always regretted because I thought it was something that I'd like to have done more as an interesting place. And I always remember, vividly remember that our first gig ever in Australia was part of a festival. I think it was the Perth International Festival. It was in Perth. Mm. It was some big festival. And the first show was an open air show somewhere in town. Uh, And it was canceled because the weather forecast said it might rain. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it just thought it was brilliant and I, I wondered up down the years whether that was Australian for we haven't sold any tickets uh, could be <laughs> or, or, or it was just funny you know we showed up and it was a perfect they were in the middle of a heat wave I, was, I remember that it was like one of the hottest places I'd ever been and uh, the kind of guy who was running the show came out and I said I'm sorry I have to cancel it because the weather forecast is predicting uh, you know rainstorms so we can't go ahead and it was like <laughs> Oh, all right, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but the rest of it went ahead okay. It was fine, yeah. So I just, uh, yeah, that no, was, uh, I enjoyed that. And uh, it was, as I say, we only did it, we only played Australia once, but uh, I wish it had been more. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was great. Yeah, uh, actually, I thought it was more. I, maybe it's because Christine's been here numerous times since then, and maybe I just got them mixed up between your tours and, and her tour, yeah. Does she play down there? Does she? Uh, she's there? been here regularly over the years, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So did you? Oh, maybe that, that's why I'm getting confused. I think, yeah. Possibly. Yeah. No, I only came once. So with, with Christy, and I only came. Yeah, once. yeah. Yeah. Did your um your songwriting procedure change, or the way you approach songwriting change when you were writing songs in those years with Christine in mind as the singer? 
I think so. I think, um, I mean, I think I knew by then how to write songs. Um, you know, I developed something of a style and an ability, I suppose. Uh, what was interesting was writing songs specifically for somebody else to sing, um, particularly for a female to sing. So you, you kind of had to get a slightly different head on as to how you approached it. And uh, that was that was interesting. That was a good learning curve. That was, you know, it was uh, that, it was not always easy. Um, but I think that uh, you know the best of that stuff stands up. I hope. Oh, absolutely, it does. Yeah. Before you went into that uh, duo with Christine, there was one solo album uh, of yours. Were you initially looking at going down that solo track, or at that time were you not even uh, looking past the point of that one record? Um, you know, it's funny. I've never really had a plan about <laughs> anything much, to be honest. Um, um, but it's funny. I think I might have said it when you said <laughs> this. Like what people refer to as my career, I just think you know I've never had a career. Doing music is what I do to avoid having a career, and um, I think that uh, just things happen. Really, things kind of just come along and uh, you roll with the flow. So I did that one solo record, and it, it kind of achieved what I wanted it to achieve I suppose I quite liked it and I spent you know every penny I had at that moment making the record so there was never really so I, things just come along at opportune moments for me and uh, that's pretty much how it's been right the way through really I, I did have a laugh when you said that to me about um, being in music has been your way of avoiding a career do you think that might be the secret to uh, longevity in, in the music business just ticking along in the slow lane there without any grand designs maybe yeah. it worked, worked for me I've avoided I've avoided having a job for 40 years now <laughs> <laughs> Your songs have found their way to some other wonderful artists to interpret. Have you got any personal um, favourites of uh, covers of your songs? Ooh. Wow. Um, like, um, I, I'm always highly flattered when anybody likes one of my songs enough to sing it themselves. That's, I think that's the ultimate It, it is the ultimate compliment, song. isn't it, for a songwriter, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few that, you know, I liked the Kim Cowns version of Touch and Go. I thought it was great. Uh, there's a really lovely version of Could This Be The One by a name that will not come to me right now, so I'll have to come back to that. She's a, a Scottish jazz singer. Oh, that's embarrassing, isn't it? I don't know. Um, it will come back to me eventually, but I'm getting old now. Um, <laughs> it's, that's the memory. That's the memory I was telling you about. Um, and there are odd things. I like... Uh, there's a great version of It's All Just Talk by Nina Gerber, who's a West Coast. Oh, I know Nina, player. yeah, yeah. Great player. And she did an instrumental version of that, which was lovely, really great. Um, I like that. So, yeah, there's all kind of odd things that come along. Some things surprise me. Some some things, you know, you know, it's just always nice when somebody does it. Mm. Just talk about, about your songwriting in general. Is, is there a point in your songwriting when you know that a, that a song is finished and requires no more editing? <laughs> uh, yes, never. Never? <laughs> um, They're never finished? Uh, well, they are and they aren't, aren't they? You know, you could, I can always look back on things and think, you know, I could pick out any record I've made over the last 40 years and look at it and think... Oh, I wish I'd done that differently. Or oh, really, was that? <laughs> that was that was obviously good enough on the day. Um, so I think you're always. That's what keeps you going, isn't it? It's always looking, you know, for the next, you know, for the next song or the next idea or the next challenge in some ways. So um, you know, yeah, they, they're finished. They're finished when they go out on the record. That's that iteration of it finished. Yeah, yeah. As well relief there's not much else you can do about it but in terms of some songs never you know some songs never make it onto the stage I write all the time and there are songs I write that never get beyond me shouting into the phone and you know I try and finish most things I try and you know the, the word finish in inverted commas I try and get a structure and a chord chart and a you know a lyric and so I could actually sit and sing the song from start to the end 
but whether it's finished that's that's another matter and you know you might come back in a few years time and look at it and change you know change the chords or you know I, I was playing it's funny actually there's a any trouble song called uh, open fire and oh, yeah. i thought why, well somebody had mentioned it to me the other day and um so oh, I have this little band that I, I play with locally sometimes and we, you know, just for fun really. And we were going to do that one and uh, I was looking at the chords and there was a chord in the bridge that I thought, why why on earth is that there? And it's on the record, it's clear as day. It's like this weird step through a B minor chord that is A, it's the wrong chord for the melody and B, it's completely unnecessary. I have no idea why I did it back then. And if you just take it out, it improves the thing immeasurably. <laughs> so I wrote the chart and left that one chord out. So, but we don't need that. And that's just the process of, you know, you know, 40 years later, you listen yeah. to something and you know, you know more about music and you know more generally. And you think, that, what on earth was I thinking? It's uh, clearly the wrong chord. <laughs> does, does the initial inspiration for a song come to you easier with, in, with experience in the passing of years? Um, I write all the time. I've never, I've never really suffered from that. That you know, the dreaded writer's block. So, I think it's just about because I, I tend to, I don't really have any rules about writing. So it can either, you can start with a title, you can start with a few chords in the sequence, you can start with a lyric idea, you can start with a melody, you can. Sometimes I write a whole lyric and then try and put a tune to it. it you know, it, it, there are endless ways of going at it. And I think as far as getting inspiration, then sometimes that's all it is. And, the, you know, a tune might suggest some words and you flesh that out from there. And I, I always talk about you just keep the antenna up. There's things that happen all the time or you look at things. You know, there are visual stimuli around you all the time and just looking at something might trigger an image that you can put into a song or, you know, listening to people talk. People say stuff all the time that just, you know, little odd phrases that just catch your ear mm. and you think, oh, that's cool. That's, you know, so I think a lot of it is just being switched on and aware and, you know, just receptive to the idea that things are out there in the ether and that one one way or another they're going to come your way and just you know grab onto them when they do and then yeah. work it into a going through your, your catalogue of albums there's very few instances of um, songwriting collaborations with, with other songwriters you, you've mostly written alone through the years is there something about the, the co-writing process in general that uh, doesn't really appeal to you? No I've, I have written with other people I wrote a lot with Boo Hewitt back in the late 80s um, and various other people down the years Henry Gross in Nashville I, I lived in Nashville I think the Nashville thing put me off it a little bit in that the Nashville songwriting process is largely pretty soulless in my experience hmm. in that whole you know you kind of go in a room with somebody for three hours and you come out with something and then you go in a room with somebody else for three hours and you come out with something else and you know, I had a friend who came to Nashville one time and did, was sent there by his publishing company just to write, um, you know, just to co-write every, with, with everybody and the brother. And at the end of two weeks, he was pretty shell shot. And I said, what was it like? He said, yeah, you know, well, I don't know. He said, but I do know this. And at the end of two weeks, there wasn't a single person who said to me, you know, tell me something about your life you know you got any kids what you know what do you like what do you read he said it was just all business 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 and none of the songs are worth a damn I didn't write anything that I thought was any good at all it, so, yeah it does seem like a very soulless way to to, um, to, to create art doesn't it? it almost seems like a, a songwriter's dating service <laughs> a matching, <laughs> matchmaking service <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and you know, technically, I have you know, it works, and some of those songs are massive, and some of them sell, and fine, you know, it just left me a bit cold. I mm. think it's not the way. So I, you know, now I've, I've found, I'm just trying to think. Now, just down the years, it's, I find writing a bit of you know, maybe it's my therapy. I find it a relatively solitary experience. I always used to say, you know, sitting down in a room to write with somebody is a bit like you know 
you know, your first date, isn't it, really, yeah. like you say. So, it's <laughs> like, for taking your clothes off in public or something, I don't know. It's, um, it just never felt... There was only certain people that I ever really felt that comfortable with. And because I'm actually able to write on my own, I think, um, I just do that and get on with it, really. I, I wouldn't rule out if somebody... You know, somebody I liked and admired and respected wanted to do it. I'd certainly be, you know, mm. open to give it a go. But you know, nobody rings, so <laughs> those <laughs> those phone calls don't come. So that's fine. I just carry on and uh, do my own thing. Talk about your relocation to America, which is well away from where you, your primary audiences were. Did it, did it take some time to, to find a niche there and to adjust? Um, yeah, it did. Um, I first I moved my, my uh, I moved to get married. Actually, sorry, I've got hay fever, so I'm sneezing. Um, um, yeah, my uh, second wife is American, and uh, I moved there to marry her. We lived for the first year in Minneapolis, which was you know a real baptism of not fire because it was snow on the ground the whole time. Mm. Um, and I found that very difficult, um, largely because the climate was so hostile. It's, the winters are absolutely brutal. And, you know, I was there for about a year. And at the end of that first year, I would have moved to Bogota at that point. I'd have gone anywhere warm. Um, so it was very, I found that very difficult to connect to any kind of scene. And because you just, you know, it, was, it just didn't really go anywhere. You tried to keep out of the cold um, and then um, my wife actually got a work move she was a, uh, a chemist she got moved to a uh, nutritionist sorry she was moved to Nashville they offered her a transfer to Nashville so I thought oh that can't hurt that's a you know there's music going on there so uh, we went down there and I was there for 15 years and thoroughly enjoyed it I have to say it took a while to plug into it um, and I never got anywhere near being an A-team player or writer or whatever but I worked a lot um, you know some with certain studios would use me you know as, as a player because I could play a lot of different things and I knew because I was English I had some different jokes mm. so um, <laughs> you know they would wheel me in to do stuff so there were things I did loads of demo I did I was uh, there was a guy called Roger Cook Cooking Greenaway who wrote loads of hits in the 60s yeah. Roger Moved to the, moved to Nashville and started writing country songs, and we got along. I met him, we got along, and he used me on all his uh, demos and recordings. So that was nice. So, uh, and then I landed a gig, a road gig, and a recording gig with Nancy Griffith, which was that was uh, interesting. So I did that for nearly ten years, actually, and that was it. That was interesting. That was proper country music on the road. It was the, the whole thing, and that was that was a learning experience as well. That, that was good. You've um, you've done a fair share of production work through the years as well. Does does being a musician and, and a recording artist yourself give you uh, something of an advantage uh, carrying out the role of producer? It depends what you think a producer is. In all honesty, some people, um, you know, I think some people think of the engineer is the producer, you know, because they sculpt the sound or move the microphones around or do yeah. all that. I'm, I'm not very good at that. I can I can engineer and you know I know how to plug things in and make them work. Uh, that's not really what my skill is, and I prefer to work with with good engineers. I work a lot with John Wood, who is a producer engineer of advancing years and you know great career, and he's a brilliant recording engineer and balance engineer. So that's that's always good. My skill is as is I can. Uh, get performances and I, un I think I understand songs so I can look at material and kind of make it as good as it can possibly be so if it involves mm. you know, moving a few bits around or writing a middle eight or changing the key so the singer can actually sing it or you know the practical on a practical level a musicians and I kind of understand I play enough instruments you know, not well, but well enough that I understand how they work and how how to put things together. So um, I think that's probably my skill as a producer. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an arranger, a bit of a songwriter, a bit of a performer, a bit of an artist, a bit of 
a musician. It's lots of little things that come together hmm. that means I can, you know, I can look, you know, I'm not the kind of, if, if uh, you know, if it's not happening on the studio floor, I tend to try and like to work with bands or artists who are not afraid to all get in the room and play live and make something that feels a bit like music uh, as opposed to assembled from a kit of parts and a computer. Um, so I, that's how I approach it. I try and get artists who are happy enough to kind of, who are confident enough in their ability that they can sing and play and perform, that they'll do it live on the studio floor. And if it's not happening on the studio floor, for some reason, I can usually put my finger on what that is and help to fix it. I can identify those things because I've just, you know, I know how... <laughs> And how music bolts together these days. Yeah, of course. Um, but the thought, thought of sitting with machines and, you know, whatever, forever, that, that leaves me utterly cut. I couldn't do that for a million years. I find that really boring. Tell us about working with uh, Liz Simcock, who, as you've done recently, and revisiting the, the Gregson and Colister uh, catalogue with, with her. How did all that come together? I'm sorry, one more time. You've been working with uh, Liz Simcock recently and um, revisiting the, the Gregson and Collister catalogue. Yes, uh, that came about. That was the, um, there was a label here, Cherry Bread, who wanted to uh, reissue the Gregson and Ca Collister catalogue. So that was fine. We'd never really revisited it very much. And so I talked to Chris and she was fine with that. I said, yeah, that's okay. Uh, and then they asked the million dollar question, which is, would you consider doing some shows to support it, to support the release? Um, so I can't knew what the answer was, but I asked Chris anyway, and she said, no, not a chance, don't want to do that. So I went back and said, no, Chris doesn't want to do it. And, you know, so that's it. So but then Andy, my manager said, well, why don't you just use another singer? So I thought, well, there is, you know, there's nobody that sings like Chris. But he said, uh, you know, you know, as long as people are open-minded about it, and, and you learn that people, of course, are not open-minded. Um, but as more I thought about it, I thought, well, fair enough. The songs are not going to get played any other way. It's not going to happen. So mm -hmm. um, I talked to Liz and said, to her, and I, I like that knowledge a long time, and she's a great singer and she's a great person, uh, which is more important, really. And I just said, you know, this is a bit of a poison chalice because nobody will like it. But, you know, do you want to give it a go? Let's at least we can go out and do the songs justice. And she was, she said, yeah, that's fine. So we went out and did it. And, you know, it was split down the middle. You would get, you know, the diehards who would say it was, you know, utter rubbish, which it certainly wasn't that. Or, and then there were other people who said, yeah, no, it's nice. She's a good singer and it's a different take on it. So that was fine. Um, uh, but it, it didn't, in the big scheme of things, I think we realised fairly quickly that it was not going to, it was a one-time thing, really. We did it, and then we actually thought, you know, I said, you know, why don't we just make a new, why don't we do a record together, a new record of new material mm. and see if that will put the thing on in people's minds. But it didn't, you know, people, and I understand why. It's like, you know, if you go and see... <laughs> this is probably sacrilege to say it, but you know, I I stopped listening to Fleetwood Mac when it wasn't Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. It mean it meant nothing to me. I thought you know the the, the original Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac is one of my all time favorite yeah. bands. Once once they got the Americans in the band, I wasn't interested at all. Um, it didn't appeal to me. But it, it suddenly struck me well, the big controversy when when they kicked out. Lindsay Buckingham, whatever, two years ago, and they got, you know, Mike Campbell, who's one of the greatest guitar players on the planet, and Neil Finn, who's one of the greatest singers and writers on the planet. I thought that can't can't be anything but an improvement. You know, that's got to improve the band. <laughs> and you know, but of course, your average Fleetwood Mac American version fan thought it was terrible. You yeah. know, they weren't having it at that time. So. Do you know what I mean? I, that's just the point: is that you know, people's people like what they like. Yeah. And the whole, they don't like to be challenged, and they don't like anything that they don't like. <laughs> so, um, 
So I think the thing with, with Liz, I wouldn't rule out, we'll certainly do something again at some point. Uh, and the thing with Liz is that she has a full-time job. She's a uh, she's a cancer, specialist cancer nurse. And it was it's very hard for her to tour. She would have to take her yearly allocation of leave to tour. And it just became, I thought, you know, became the law of diminishing returns. I felt bad about it. I thought, well, it's not going to turn into a career for her. And we're just using up all her holidays to go and do she might, <laughs> you know, she might actually want to go on holiday with her husband and go somewhere nice. <laughs> Hey, I noticed on, on your website um, quite a number of album releases in, in 2020 alone. I think there was about at least eight there, I think, which I didn't know about. But are they the result of some massive creative burst of energy or are they the songs you had um, b- backlogged there? Well, it, it was a fit of absolute madness. Um, I decided in around, oh gosh, early 2019, I thought... Uh, I turned 65 in when I turned 65 up, 66 now, it must have been last year. And um, I was enjoying touring less, really. I made a decision in early 2019 that I was going to get off the road, at least as far as touring solo was concerned, because I, I just, the gigs were fun. I always liked playing, I liked being on stage, and I, I enjoy that and the interaction. But the rest of it, I just, I, I'm just over it. You know, I didn't want to be sitting in traffic jams on the motorways of England on a Friday afternoon ever again on my own, you know, for hours on end. I yeah. was fed up with it. And so uh, the gigs were starting to thin out anyway, as they do once you've been at it as long as I have with no palpable success. There's only so many times you can go to the well, really. And uh, so it seemed like a natural seemed about time to stop doing that and so I came up with this plan to have you know a big a run out and do tours you know do a bunch of tours uh, one last outing as it were and I was going to do an album every month through 2020 uh, that was my plan was to do one new album every month release it through the and I was scuppered by COVID basically I got eight released uh, but the remaining ones relied completely on, because I could mostly do those eight at home on my own. I have a little studio, so I could do that. The others were scuppered by the fact that I, they had relied musically on being able to go in a studio with other musicians. And of course, that's not been practical for well over a year now. That's not been feasible. So I had to put the remaining four on hold until such time as I can get in the studio with other players um, but no it was madness really um, I guess now that you've had basically the, the, the uh, prospect of touring taken away from you anyway by, by COVID is it giving you time to sort of reassess that thought or are you still oh I don't think touring will come back for me I think that that's done now um, I think that for lots of people the, the problem is that um you know, we're all getting older, and the, this kind of scene, the acoustic music scene, which I mostly play, I think we've all suddenly realised that there are other things to do in life. Uh, and a lot of the venues that I play have gone permanently dark. They will not reopen. Mm. They can't. They've gone. So I think what will come back, ultimately, whenever it is, there will be a new scene of some kind, but it won't be for me. And old people it'll be because we none of us have the energy to want to get up and get doing it again I don't think Mm. Um, so you know I've had it's interesting actually because initially when everything last year was cancelled I said to my agent look you know let's see if we can book some things into the tail end of 2021 the you know Q4 of this year and we had almost no take up at all because everybody's nervous about booking stuff because they just they don't think it's going to happen you know COVID is here for a long time yet and also you know they've all found the the venues have gone and they've all found other things to do with their lives or or they will do once we come out of lockdown whenever (laughs) that ever happens Mm. yeah pretty much the story of the world over well, I, you know, it is. You know, you, you tend not to. History, history tells you you tend not to get through pandemics in much less than two years. Yeah. 
Very true. And the World Health Organization, one of the execs said a couple of weeks ago, and it was going crazy in India. He said, you know, you know, the West thinks it's got it under control, but you know, it's only just getting started in the rest of the world. So it'll be in circulation for a long time, I think, and unless people really are sensible about it and the vaccination program ramps up worldwide in a meaningful way it'll you know it'll just drag on for for quite a while but no doubt you'll still keep uh, writing and recording but that's um yeah. something you'll always do yeah i think so yeah and i could do i do a lot of um you know i can do a certain amount of things it's not my ideal way to do it i have to say it's not what i would choose to do uh, but you can do a fair amount of things down the line these days you know so i'll play sessions for people and you know they send me the track through the ether i'll play on it and fire it back and they seem to mostly be happy about that it's not an ideal way to make music um, i much prefer to be in a in a room with real people playing in real time and then you can react to each other it's, that sounds like music to me everything else is just this kind of it's a you know it's a i suppose it's a computer generated version of music really um where it's all a bit preordained but um it's, you can do it there's a lot of things i can you know i can do a fair amount of stuff here just down the line and it's you know keeps me interested and keeps me going so that's fair enough um you know, but i look forward to you know i'm looking forward to a time when it's feasible to get back into studios with musicians playing in real time because yeah. that's, that's that's how real music gets made exactly in my... and just one thing before i let you go clive if you could, if you could go back at any point and redo anything at any any time of your um your music time in music uh, and make a different choice a different decision was there anything you'd change no, not really. I would change, you know, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, you would change everything. You know, you would do things in a different way. But um, no, not really. You know, on the whole, I think I've been incredibly lucky. Like I said, I've never had to play music I didn't like just to make money. Um, I've got away with it for 40 years and, you know. Um, so, no, not really. Um, had I been more successful I suspect that that would have brought you know some some real problems with it for me because I'm not very good at you know at the off switch um, so it's probably kept me grounded throughout really mm. and things just you know limp along in in a Gregson manner really um, so no that was not really you know, in terms of the music part of it, no, I think, you know, you, like I say, it, you would change everything because, you know, you listen to it, I listen to it back and think, as I said earlier on, you know, there's always things that you think, bloody hell, what was I thinking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah, you change everything, but on the same, to make the music better, but in terms of, you know, I've never had a plan, so... <laughs> It would, it would be very difficult to kind of justify yeah. changing anything. Whatever was a plan in the first place. Really. <laughs> so true. Hey, Clive, thanks for your time. It's been a, a treat catching up with you, and we we certainly have are glad that you have managed to avoid a real career over the past forty years because it's brought us lots of uh, fantastic songs. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. You take care. See you. You too. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.